All right, I think we will kick it off. So I just want to start off by thanking everybody for, for joining us here today. Good afternoon, we're so glad to have you. Um, this is our third and final session in what we're calling our Berkeley Business Boot Camp. We're so happy to have been able to partner with some really incredible um, students from the UC Berkeley MBA program um, in order to, to join us on a couple different topics, um, all related to, to you know, supporting your business, especially through um, this COVID time. Um, so today we have Drew with us, who's going to be talking about financial logistics as far as using cost and profitability analysis um, to improve your profitability. Um, before we jump in, I do want to just do some housekeeping. If you have any questions that pop up throughout, um, throughout his presentation, feel free to drop them either in the chat box or the Q&A box here in Zoom. Um, and we will get to your questions. We'll have a couple pauses throughout um, to make sure your questions get answered. Um, a little bit about Pacific Community Ventures if you're um, new to us. Um, Pacific Community Ventures is a nonprofit dedicated to the support and success of small businesses. Um, and we do this through a combination of our fair and affordable lending program, our free business advising program, and our research and consulting program. Um, and this webinar here today is brought to you by the business advising program um, in collaboration with UC Berkeley. And um, if you're interested in getting paired with a free business advisor to support you through whatever challenges or opportunities you have upcoming in your business, um, I'll share some information both in the chat box here today um, with our sign up link um, as well as in a follow-up email after the fact as well. Um, so now, without further ado, I'd love to pass it over to you, Drew, if you'd like to give a brief introduction and kick us off. Yeah, sure. So give me one sec just to make sure this PowerPoint is working. So yeah, thanks for having me. Again, everybody, thank you for attending. So just to give a quick bio of myself. So I'm originally from New York, um, but Sorry, one quick second, Morgan. Are you able to see the bio slide right now? I just want to make sure I'm in the right place. Yep. Cool. All right. So I'm originally from New York, but I, I went to Tulane University in New Orleans, and I graduated with a degree in finance. Um, but right after college, I wasn't really interested in doing the typical finance career path. So um, I did this program called Teach for America. So I was a math and special education teacher at a local charter school in New Orleans for a couple of years. Um, then decided to try a little bit something different. So the, the last three years after I was a teacher, um, I took a little bit of a 180 and I worked at this company called Blue Vine Capital, um, where I was a senior underwriter in financial analysis, where I got to underwrite and interact with a bunch of small businesses um, and underwrite a bunch of small business loans ranging anywhere from as small as $5,000 all the way up to a few million dollars. Um, and then I just moved out to Berkeley, California in late June, so a few months ago. So I moved from New Orleans and now I'm in Berkeley, California as of the last few months. So just to give you an overview of what we're gonna go over today. So essentially I'm just gonna be providing you frameworks and different ways to look at your business. So the first thing that we're gonna be starting with is a cost analysis. And essentially what a cost analysis is, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, is a way of organizing your profit and loss statement, looking at your different costs and trying to figure out which costs um, are good areas to attack and reduce in order to increase the profitability of your business. Then the second thing we're gonna be talking about is profitability analysis. And essentially what a profitability analysis is, and again, I'll repeat this, is, is the idea of when you look at your general profit and loss statement, all it tells you is your revenues, your costs, and then your net income that you're taking home at the end of the day. So what a profitability analysis does, it allows you to divide up your business into segments and figure out where are the most profitable parts of your business and therefore which are the parts of your business should you spend more time and resources in order to capitalize on that profitability. So the three ways we're gonna segment is, is we're gonna segment into profitability analysis by the competition. So this is essentially you comparing your different costs um, and profitability compared to similar competitors within your industry or, or similar industry benchmarks. And the second thing we're gonna be talking about within that profitability analysis space um, is profitability analysis by customers. So essentially, 
Um, when it comes to profitability of customers, there's certain types of customers that bring more profits to your business and therefore makes more sense to focus on retaining as well as recruiting these types of customers to be long time uh, and loyal customers to your business. And then the third area within profitability analysis um, is going to be by product or service. So essentially there's a few different ways of doing this, but the whole idea is that you can compare the profitability of different products and services that you offer and figure out which are my most profitable uh, products or services. And then even in some cases, which products or services are maybe providing negative profitability. And therefore I should, uh, as a business owner, decide which ones I want to prioritize. So moving on to the next slide. So we're going to start with the profitability analysis through our cost structure. Um, now I'm going to show you an example of a profit and loss statement if you haven't seen it on the next slide. Um, but essentially when you're looking at your profit about profitability and your profit and loss statement, um, essentially the main components are your revenues, which is essentially the cash that's coming into your business or the money that's coming into your business. And then you take away your costs, which are obviously the costs that are going out of your business. And then at the end of the day, you're left with your profitability. In other words, your net income. So this is the money that you bring home at the end of the day after you take your revenues and subtract your costs. Now, when we're looking at those costs, there's two main types of costs. So one of them is called fixed costs, which is essentially uh, types of costs that remain the same regardless of the amount of sales volume. So an example might be rent, insurance, um, administrative salaries, overhead. So think of these as being constant and they're not changing. So if you're a restaurant and you sell 100 dinners, um, the rent, insurance, administrative salaries are gonna be the same regardless of whether you're selling 100 dinners in a month, 200 dinners in a month, 500, 1,000, and so on. So these fixed costs are the costs that are gonna be remaining the same regardless of your sales volume. Then there's also variable costs. So variable costs differ from fixed costs in the sense that they change with the change in sales volume. So think if you're a restaurant and you're selling 100 dinners, it's gonna cost you more to sell 200 dinners because you have to pay more in order to acquire more raw materials, more uh, ingredients, pay for more shipping costs in order to bring those ingredients. So those variable costs are gonna change with the change in the sales volume. So bear with me on this next slide. This is an example of a profit and loss statement. It's a little bit blurry right now, but just wanted to go over a few main points of what a profit and loss statement looks like. So essentially on this, it's giving you the different uh, months. So this is your profit and loss over the month of June, then you have May, and then you have April. Now the top line, these sales are what we talked about. The revenue or sales is the money coming into your business. Then there's the cost of goods sold, which is a type of cost that is very, pretty much the same as the variable cost that I talked about on the last slide. So in this example, you can see the cost of goods sold for this lemonade stand is lemons, sugar, cups, ice, things of that nature. So as you can imagine, if you're owning a lemonade stand, as you sell more and more lemonade, your costs are also gonna increase in order to create that lemonade, right? You need, if you sell more lemonade, you're gonna need more lemons to pay for, you're gonna need more sugar, you're gonna need more cups, you're gonna need more ice, etc. So these costs of goods sold, for the most part, are your variable costs. So again, they're changing with your sales volume. Then at the end of that, you're left with your gross profit, which is essentially your revenue minus your cost of goods sold. So an easy way to think of what this gross profit means is, let's say you sell um, a cup of lemonade for $5, and it costs you $4 to make that cup of lemonade. Um, the cost that go into that $4 could be the lemons, the ice, the sugar, et cetera. The gross profit is how much you're left with at the end of that sale. So you sold it for $5, it cost you $4, your gross profit that you're left over with in that case would be that $1 left over that you're keeping. Um, and then these SG&A expenses, so if you've seen a profit and loss statement, you'll either see it as SG&A expenses or sometimes operating expenses. And for the most part, these are your fixed costs. So like we talked about on the last page, things like rent, insurance, administrative salaries. In this case, there's bookkeeping and advertising as well. And then once you start with your sales, you take away your costs of goods sold, which is your variable cost. You take away your fixed costs. You're left with that net income, which is essentially the money that you're bringing home at the end of every day. So essentially what a cost analysis does is here's an example of a cost analysis. Now, this is very similar. It essentially took our P&L, our profit and loss statement on the last page, 
and converted the costs into percentages of revenue. So you'll see right here, net sales is listed as 100% and cost of sales is listed at 60%. That's essentially telling us that our cost of sales are, is, represents 60% of our total revenues. And there's other numbers in terms of our cost that we're looking at. So in this case, research and development is, adds up to about 2% of our total revenues. Selling and administrative expenses represents 7% of our total revenues. Operating income represents 31% uh, of our total revenues, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea of a cost analysis is it creates these percentages as a percentage of your revenue. And it gives you an idea of where some costs that maybe you could potentially decrease. So if I'm right now looking at my cost analysis, I see that my cost of sales makes up 60% of my total revenue. So that may be a reason or a red flag to look into if there's a certain cost item that represents a very significant portion of my total revenue. So in this case, cost of sales represents 60% of my revenue. So that may be a hint that this is something I should target and go after in terms of analyzing where my cost of goods sold is coming from. There might be other certain costs. So in other cases, maybe selling and administrative expenses is 7%. And maybe that seems high compared to the way it's been in the past. So that might be another red flag that, hey, this is something I need to look into. Why are my selling and administrative expenses uh, so much higher than they used to be? So when you're looking at this, when you're looking at this cost analysis as percentage of revenue, there's two sort of basic uh, basis points upon which you can compare it to. So one thing is this is like a 2011 profit and loss statement. One thing you can do is compare it to the way your business has performed in the past. So let's say my cost of sales is 60% in 2011, but it was only 50% or 40% in 2010, 2009, 2008. Then a light bulb should go off in your head saying, hey, my cost of goods sold has been increasing a ton over the last couple of years. So there may be something going on and maybe this is something that I need to look into. And then another thing that you could potentially look into, and I'll, I'll get into this in a, in a little while, um, but essentially, you can compare some of these percentages to, um, to the industry average. So there's a bunch of like free information that you could find online that basically tells you what are the typical like cost of sales, what are the typical gross margins within your industry. So for example, you might be a retailer, retail store, and your cost of sales is running about 60%. But you do a little bit of digging and you find out the normal cost of sales is more like 30% or 40% in the retail industry uh, based on companies that are similar to you. So by benchmarking yourself against your competitors or the industry average, it should give you a hint that, hey, uh, there's maybe something I can improve upon if my cost of sales are so much higher than the typical businesses in the space that I'm operating. So a little bit more about what to actually do with this cost information. So I don't want to get into like all the specific formulas, but essentially what I want to go over today is just a framework of how you can use cost analysis, how you could use profitability analysis to think about your business and prioritize different areas of your business. So one of the things you can use is called a break even point. So once you know your fixed costs, once you know your gross profit percentage, which right now it's not important to know, but I, I just want to let you know that with this cost information, you could figure out your break even point. Essentially, what your break-even point tells you is how many sales do I need in order to cover my costs? So essentially, it's saying how many sales would I need in order to reach the point where my net income is zero, where I'm neither losing money nor am I making money. So this gives you an idea of the way your cost structure is so you can determine how realistic your sales targets are and make adjustments based on that. So if you realize your break-even point is 1,000 sales based on your cost structure, and you say, hey, a thousand sales seems super optimistic and not particularly realistic, then that's something to look into to sort of change your cost structure. Um, and then another thing, I hinted about this on the last slide. So essentially, looking at a cost analysis enables you to analyze the major cost levers. So whether you're comparing it to your past performance or comparing certain percentages to your competition or industry averages, it gives you a hint at which cost levers you may need to do a little bit of digging into in order to, to decrease. So on the next slide, I'm gonna go into what some of those cost levers are and how you could potentially go about decreasing. them. So there's two main type of costs that we already talked about a little bit. So on the fixed cost side, let's say you were looking at your profit and loss statement and you realize your marketing expense took up way too high of a percentage. 
that may give you a hint that maybe there's stuff you could do on your marketing to maybe use more effective marketing that's maybe a little bit less expensive and cut down on that cost. So whether that's networking with more people in your industry is one option. You could potentially build a customer email list and newsletter so that you could reach the same amount of people without having to pay uh, for certain marketing services online. Uh, possibly you can increase your social media use, which will help you attract more followers without incurring an additional cost on your business to pay for ads or any sort of marketing expenditure expenditure in that nature. Another thing is maybe you realize that you can improve operational efficiencies. So maybe you can encourage, let's say you have a restaurant, maybe it's possible that employees who are on the front lines have a better idea of how to make their work a little bit more efficient. So let's say you have a restaurant and your waiter typically covers only three or four uh, tables at a given time. It may be possible that talk to your employees and see if they're able to cover, let's say five or six tables at a given time and therefore improve your operational efficiencies of your business. Another type of fixed costs you could potentially decrease, so this may be a little bit more difficult, is decreasing occupancy costs. So obviously rent, it's probably hard to, to negotiate with your landlord in order to decrease your rent, um, but it's possible that utilities and hours of operation you can actually cut down upon. So let's say you have a business and you're open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m and each hour you're open, you have to pay $100 in additional fixed costs. And let's say from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you make only $20 of revenue per day. Then you may be able to look into that and say, hey, it's not really profitable for me to be open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Maybe I'll just make it from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then there's also variable costs. So one of the biggest costs and the, the biggest variable costs is the cost of goods sold that we talked about on the last page. Oops. So. In terms of your cost of goods sold, these are supplies, materials, expenses, your sourcing. So if you're a restaurant, it's essentially how much you're paying to buy your ingredients from your suppliers. If you're a retailer who sells clothes, it's maybe how much you're paying to your suppliers to go ahead and actually buy that fabric. So we're gonna go over in the next page a little bit, what are some ways you can actually go about decreasing your sourcing, uh, or excuse me, decreasing the cost of your sourcing, and therefore decreasing your cost of goods sold. And then there's also the possibility to, decre to decrease production costs. So whether that's um, you're a retailer and you waste a ton of fabric when you're cutting and creating your clothes, it may be a sign that maybe you could be a little bit more efficient when creating your products. All right, so in terms of the cost of goods sold, what are some ways to maybe improve your affordable sourcing? So we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but essentially you could benchmark your cost of goods sold both against your competitors and to your own company past performance. So that should give you a hint that, hey, maybe um, my competition or in my past, my cost of goods sold was a little bit lower and maybe a sign that there's something you can do, or do in order to sort of bring that back down to a more manageable cost percentage. So this is especially important uh, in times like these, kind of crazy times with COVID, that it's always good to have emergency contingency plans in place. So a lot of suppliers are a lot more stretched than they have been in the past. So it's just a, a general tip in terms of your source. It's always good to have multiple options and diversify your, your sources in case one uh, supplier for whatever reason is not able to provide up to their typical level uh, of production. So one of the things you could look into is essentially considering potential alternative suppliers for your ability or your own ability to make the product. So there's always potential different suppliers out there who may be able to provide you the same product or service with the same quality, but at a lower price. So there's a few different ways to potentially look into doing this. So there's certain online businesses where if you're pu purely an online business, um, there's certain drop shipping suppliers who could essentially do this for you. So there's examples like Dropship Direct, Oberlo, Bilba, there's literally countless examples. Essentially what these do is if you have an online business, and a customer wants to buy your product, you don't have to hold that inventory. Essentially, these companies can source and essentially deliver the product directly from their locations directly to your customers. So this is one option to potentially look into. Another thing is, just in general, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, there's industry-specific directories, there's business assistance organizations, obviously PCV is one of them, there's different trade associations, professional publications that literally have lists of suppliers within your industry who may be a little bit more affordable uh, and realistic for your business. And then the third thing, which this is just starting to get sort of built out. So 
it's not necessarily fully fleshed out, but there's different business to business marketplaces like Alibaba, Wholesale Central, EC21, Global Sources. And these are essentially marketplaces where you could source the different products that you need. So these are businesses that are selling to other businesses or other small businesses uh, in order to source and be a supplier for these businesses. Now, I think this goes without saying, but there's not just price that you need to factor in when you're comparing different suppliers. So obviously it would be nice in a perfect world just to have the cheapest supplier. But obviously there's different concerns like quality. You might be sacrificing a little bit of quality if you're decreasing your price and that may have an impact on your business. It's also important to keep in mind reliability. So it's possible that one supplier may be a slightly more expensive, but you know 100% of the time when I ask for this, I'm going to get this in on time in order to service my customers. And then there's always, this is super important, and I think this part gets neglected, it's always important to keep an open line of communication and keep a good relationship with your current suppliers about your needs. So if, if you notice your cost of goods sold had gone up to 50 or 60%, and it used to be 30 or 40%, I think it's reasonable if you have an open line of communication with your suppliers to let them know what's happening and see if they have any solutions. It's possible if you pass that information along that they, your supplier may say, hey, we're able to cut our prices or if you buy in bulk a little bit more, we could offer you more discounts and therefore decrease your cost of goods sold. Um, or maybe you could even pay a little bit early in order to get that discount with your supplier for early payment. So I know I just went through a lot. So I'm going to give a quick 30 second break for any questions. So I'm going to pause for 30 seconds. You can take a break to get water or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type it in the chat right now. But essentially, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Uh, if you have any questions, to, just to type it in the chat. All right, we'll give it about 15, 20 more seconds. And if no questions, that's fine, but just wanted to give a quick little break. All right, we do have a question that came in. Um, how does one do this for a service where there are no goods sold? Good question. So um, if I understand this question correctly, it's essentially asking how does one do this for a service where there are no goods sold? Mm -hmm. um, so I assume this is referring to some sort of like professional services where it's not necessarily a good, but it's a, it's a service that's being provided. Oh, she followed up saying a tutoring service, yes. Gotcha. That's a good question. So I, I guess one way of looking into it is a lot of professional services organizations like a tutoring service. The main cost of goods sold is sort of like your opportunity cost. So if you're running your own um, tutoring service, your cost of goods sold is essentially how much you can make for your given time or how much is your time worth. So if you work 10 hours and you say your time is worth $25, then essentially the cost of goods sold would be that 10 hours times the, the $25 that essentially your time is worth. Um, and then so we had a question looks like on what tool to recommend for budgeting. That is a good question. So I, I know a lot of people use simple things such as Excel. So Excel is one thing that you can use. Another thing you could generally use is your accounting software from the past. So let's say you have your profit and loss statement uh, via QuickBooks or NetSuite or any number of accounting services. You can look at your past three months, past six months, nine months, 12 months, and use that to sort of project what your future might be. So essentially the idea is that if you think your past is gonna be similar to your future, you could use sort of the similar idea of what my past costs uh, and cash flows were in order to figure out what my, what my future cash flows were. Um, and then just in general, as like a higher note, a lot of people use what's called cash flow projections. So on Excel or whatever it is, they'll, they'll create like 12 week cash flow projections, figuring out hey, how much am I gonna have to pay these employees? How much am I gonna have to pay in order to buy new equipment? And just to make sure your cash inflows and outflows make sense so that you always have positive cash in order to account for these different expenditures that you're gonna be having. Good question. So Becky uh, following up said, how would I record my hours as a cost of goods sold? So I think generally speaking, a lot of people don't. So you could choose to include it or you could choose not to include it, especially if you're self-employed. Um, it's sort of like 50-50 on what you wanna do, but you could potentially include sort of your hours that you're worth. So if, like I was saying before, if you work 20, 
you work 20 hours and essentially the amount your your cost of goods sold would be like $20 per hour, then you'd multiply that $20 uh, times the 20 hours. But let me see if I can get back to you in the future on that. I don't have a great answer in terms of how to actually go about recording uh, the cost of goods sold from an accounting standpoint. Yeah, Drew, if you want to get me that information after the fact, I can make sure we connect you with Becky to, sure. uh, to get that question answered later. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. That was a very good question. Cool. So we're going to get going on to profitability analysis now. So we talked about cost analysis, which is essentially a type of profitability analysis. But now we're going to be talking a little bit about profitability analysis through segments. So essentially, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples now about how to do this. Um, but I'm not going to go into super nitty gritty details. Again, I'm just looking to provide you sort of a framework for a way to look at your business in order to improve your profitability. So what profitability analysis is, it's a study of the profitability of your business's outputs, whether it's between different products or services that you offer or between different customers, different locations you have, if you have multiple locations, different channels. So profitability between selling online versus selling in person. Um, and then between different competitors, which we talked about a little bit when we were talking about benchmarking your different costs and profitability versus that of your competitors. So essentially what this framework does is it empowers you to make more informed business decisions. Because when you're looking at that profit and loss statement, if all it's telling you is the overall profitability of your business, it's not telling you which areas or which small segments of the business you should actually focus on. Now, in like a bunch of different types of things, including non-business things, you'll hear of the 80-20 rule, which is essentially the idea that 20% of your effort produce, produces 80% of your results. So that's something you could think about, whether it's customers or locations or channels. It's honestly the case that maybe a, like a smaller portion of your business provides the most profitability, and therefore it makes more sense to like increase the effort in order to increase these higher results. So again, business-wide profitability calculations are easy, but it's much more difficult to actually segment profitability calculations of your business. So the first thing, we talked a little bit about how to do this in the cost analysis example, but one thing you could do is benchmark against the competition. So in this example, I just made up a hypothetical scenario. Let's say we're Eddie's Hardware and we're comparing us to a typical hardware store within the industry. Now let's say Eddie's Hardware in a given month brings in $1,000 of revenue, cost of goods sold is $800, which leaves you with $200 in gross profit, which is 20% of that $1,000. My gross profit's 20%. Then I have operating expenses of 100, so I'm left with profits of $100, which amounts to 10% of that $1,000. Now, excuse me, given um, the information we could use to compare us to our competitors, Let's say a typical hardware store has a revenue of $5,000, cost of goods sold is $2,500, and the gross profit margin is 50%. Then with operating expenses of $1,000, if you start with $5,000, you take away $2,500, you take away $1,000 in operating expenses, you're left with profits of $1,500, and $1,500, the profit margin of $1,500 divided by that $5,000 in revenue leaves you with profit margins of 30%. So just looking at this, if I'm an owner of Eddie's Hardware, I see my gross profit margin is 20%, but that of the typical uh, hardware store within the industry is 50%. And it's telling you your gross profit that you bring home at the end of the day is much lower than that of a typical uh, business within your industry. So it gives you a hint that, hey, either I need to increase my price and increase my revenue per item sold, or maybe there's stuff that I could do to decrease my cost of goods sold which we talked about a little bit earlier with improving your affordable sourcing. So maybe finding suppliers who are able to produce that product for a lot cheaper. The whole idea of this of benchmarking against your competition is it tells you where and if there is room for improvement in order to actually decrease your costs. Okay. So that's the main idea of that part. Then the second thing I wanted to look into a little bit is the profitability by customer. So this is essentially kind of a crude graph, but just to give you an idea of how it looks like with your customers. So this green area represents like your most profitable customers. This yellow area is sort of your mid-tier, somewhat profitable, but not super profitable customers. And then this red area is sort of your customers that you have to spend a lot of time and resources in order to cater to, but actually decreases a little bit of profitability. 
So if you look at this graph, the profitability is increasing as we sell to more and more people where these sort of A customers or five-star customers. And then profitability starts to level off as we sell more and more to our sort of mid-tier customers. And then it even trails off, as I said before, as we sell more and more to these sort of uh, like one-star customers who are not as profitable, but do take up a lot of time and resources of the business. So just to give you an example of how we would look at this, so there's different ways to get this information, but I just wanted to give sort of a general overview of an example. So let's say I'm operating a restaurant and I'm looking at the different types of customers that I may have. So let's say my five-star customers um, typically shop in my restaurant from five to seven. They typically come in with four people. They spend about $50, $60. My cost to provide or my cost to get sold is 25. My profit for every five-star customer is $35. Now, let's say my three-star customers typically come at lunchtime. They have a smaller party size, and ultimately, the profitability for this type of customer is $15 per customer. Then I have my one-star customer. Let's say these are just people at work coming by themselves between the times of one to three, and the profit for each of these customers is only $5. Now, if you look at this profit per segment, our five-star customer, every time they come in, we make $35 in profit. But our one-star customer, we only make $5 in profit. So if you were to compare that, you'd need to sell to seven different one-star customers just to equal the profitability of selling to one five-star customer. So the whole idea of the segmenting is that it shows you which are your most important or most profitable customers, and therefore, which customers should you focus on? So just to give you context of what you might do in this example, if you had this information, you might say, hey, by far my most profitable customer are my five-star customers. They typically come to dinner time, come during dinner time, and they typically bring a larger size group of about four people. So it's possible that I can conclude that, hey, my most profitable customers come for dinner and they bring an average party size of four people so that these maybe are more likely to be families. So if my most profitable customer is families, then that should give you a hint that what can I do to actually attract more of these families and what can I do to keep the current family customers that I have? So if your restaurant in this example it might be a good idea to introduce kids menu or crayons just to attract these types of customers and attract these types of families that are actually the most profitable for your business. Another thing you could even do is it's possible that teenagers are part of these families, so increase your social media usage, whatever it is, in order to attract these types of people. So essentially the whole idea is learning how to segment and figure out who are my most profitable customers and therefore who should I be spending the most time and resources to attract and retain. So Essentially, that whole idea is just figuring out which are the most profitable, like I said, and then you could use it even in another example. So if you're a retail store and you want to figure out your most profitable type of customer, then the same thing. You would see what you could do in order to appeal to that most profitable type of customer. And then the next part I wanted to dive into. So we talked about comparing profitability analysis by competitor. We just talked about comparing profitability analysis um, between different customers. And then another thing you could look into is comparing profitability analysis by your different products or services that you either currently offer or may choose to offer. So I wanted to introduce a completely different example on this one. So let's say you're a fitness center and you already have an established business. Now you're deciding whether or not you want to create a new one hour fitness uh, group fitness class or a new one hour personal training session. Now, based on the different projections that you have, maybe you figure out the times per week that you could offer the session, the number of customers, and the price, and therefore figure out your incremental revenues. So if you're deciding to add a new project, you're look, the two things that you want to look into are the incremental revenues and the incremental costs. Now, what an incremental revenue is, it's essentially the revenues created solely by this product or service. So if I currently have a customer base, that is gonna keep coming to my fitness center regardless of whether or not I have this new one hour fitness class, then that's not gonna be incremental revenue. Because incremental revenue is simply revenue that is created solely by adding or solely by having this product or service. And the same thing goes with incremental costs. So if you already have a person who, or a trainer who works at this fitness center and they're already working during those hours, it's not an additional incremental cost if they would then be a te teaching these additional classes since you wouldn't have to pay for another employee. Um, although there could be other incremental costs such as 
maybe you need to buy a little bit more equipment or have other expenses or utilities or hours of operation in order to introduce this new product or service. So that's one way you can look at when you're uh, looking across potentially comparing or offering different products or services. And another thing you can look into is a simple example of a profitability analysis by your current products or services is figuring out which are your most profitable products or services. So let's say product one, you sell for $10. Product two, you only sell for $15. Now it's possible that your cost of goods sold on product one is $4, which means the gross profit that you take home from selling that product is $6. And then product two, let's say, even though you sell it for more, it costs you a lot more to also produce. So it only brings you profitability of $4. Then similar, you can do this with each of your products and services and figure out which are my most profitable products and services, and therefore, which should I maybe appeal to and start to market to more. And it's funny, you'll even see examples of this where, let's say they have eight different products, and then they realize that two of the products actually provide negative profits. So this idea of comparing and segmenting your different products enables you to not only focus on the most profitable products, but also stop producing, stop selling the ones that actually reduce the profits uh, of your business. Okay, so we talked a little bit just now about profitability analysis and how to actually um, go about doing it with, with a couple of easy samples. So whether you're comparing it by customer, by product or service, or against the competitor. Now, in all three of these examples, if you want to track and organize the information, there's a bunch of ways to go about doing this. So specifically by customer and by product or service, and even against the competitor, it's relatively easy to do via different accounting software. So whether you use NetSuite, QuickBooks, Wave, again, so many different examples of what you can use. Um, you can have this information and divide it between your different products or services or divide it between your customers, which I'll show you an example of on the next page once we get to it. Now, when we're looking at customers, how do we actually figure out back to that example, like who comes in from five to seven, who comes in from 11 to one? Like it's great if we know this information, but it might be a little bit more difficult to actually go about getting this information. So one of the things you can do, is a lot of small businesses do that. There's different email lists. You could do surveys rewards programs to encourage people to actually take part in these surveys. There's different sort of customer relationship management software. I don't know too much about that one. That's another option as well. And these are different ways where you could survey different customers and figure out different dem demographics. So if you realize that this customer tends to come in with three or four people, and like here are the things that they're looking for in a business when deciding where to shop, then it should give you a hint in terms of like who your most profitable uh, customers are and what are the things that they actually look for. Uh, so you can attract these types of people. And then again, like I was saying before, it essentially helps you to figure out who to market to and who are the most, or what are the most effective marketing plans. Then on product or service, so again, most uh, accounting software enables you to portion different revenues and costs to different products. So it may take a little bit more time, but essentially the idea is that you can, when you're putting together your profit and loss statement, the accounting software will automatically tell you based on which items you sell, which ones are providing what revenues, what costs, and what profits to your business. And then when you're trying to track against competitors, when you're whether you're doing the cost analysis or just general profitability analysis versus that of your competitors, again, uh, it helps you to have accounting software or whatever it is that you use, could even be Excel, to actually figure out what your own different costs are as a percentage of your revenue. And then you could look at the different competition. So you could compare it to the direct competition, which is essentially other businesses who are offering the same exact products or services, indirect competition, which offers slightly different, or even substitute competition, especially in a world we live in now where things are constantly changing. You can imagine, say, a watch company 20 years ago, maybe the substitute competition would be cell phones, because instead of shopping for watches, people use cell phones now to take time. So that'd be an example of a substitute competitor uh, that you should maybe consider when comparing your margins or different costs to. Another thing you can do, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, is you could speak with trade associations, small business assistance organizations. There's even different things like Yelp, Google, Google Local, Angie's List, et cetera, where you can compare different prices uh, that your competitors are offering uh, similar products or services as you for. And then there's a bunch, there's literally just a ton of different information. So. You can look up IRS Corporate Source Book, um, the U.S. Census Bureau, Dun & Bradstreet, 
And a lot of these have just general industry information on what the typical margins and costs are within a given industry. So back to the example before, it might be possible that through this information, you figure out that restaurants typically have cost of goods sold percentage of about 40%, then you could use your own profit and loss statement to compare to the business or industry average. And then just wanted to show you a couple quick examples before we wrap up. So of what this actually looks like when you're looking at your accounting software. So this is an example of QuickBooks, which is a pretty popular accounting software. And this is just an example of tracking profitability by customer segments. So this first customer segment are customers who come in who are referred from a client. And it tells you the different revenues and costs and overall profitability of that segment. It also tells you different segments in terms of the customer segment who are referred from friends or referred from the yellow pages, et cetera. So you would essentially get this information um, once point of purchase, once people buy your product, you can introduce like random surveys and then figure out how did they actually learn about your business. So you can actually define and, and segment the different profitability by these different customer segments. So that's just one example. Another example, just cause again, there's tons of different types of options for accounting software. So this is a different example of NetSuite. And this is an example of comparing your profitability by different products. So uh, I don't want to go into this too much, but essentially one product is this no class. This other one is fiber optics. Another one is broadband. It's another way within your own accounting software where you figure out what are the revenues that I'm bringing in for this product? What are the costs that are going out for this product? As well as what is the overall profitability of this product? So again, that's just another example of how you can actually go about doing it. And then, I don't want to be super exclusive in terms of just NetSuite, um, just QuickBooks. There's countless other examples that if you currently don't have an accounting software, you should look into FreshBooks, Wave. Um, I literally just named four or five out of like 50 or 100 that are super useful. Um, so yeah, most, most accounting software have different packages where you can look into these different options. So yeah, that's, that's essentially the main part of the presentation. So again, I didn't want to go into super detailed ways of looking at your profit and loss statement. But the whole general idea is that from looking at a profit and loss statement by itself, there's not necessarily that inf much information that you can glean. But by, per by dividing your different customer segments, by dividing your different products, by comparing your profit and loss statement and different cost analysis to your competitors, it gives you a lot more insight into what you need to actually go improve. And then once you figure out what areas uh, to target and attack in terms of where you can improve, then you can come up with the ideas for what you actually need to do to improve those ideas. So we talked about COGS, we talked about how you can improve your affordable sourcing and uh, ultimately decrease different types of costs. But essentially the whole idea is this framework lets you know where you need to attack and then it's up to you to figure out how you can actually attack these different costs and decrease these different costs um, and ultimately improve the profitability of your business. So again, thanks everybody for coming in. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to a minute, maybe a little bit longer actually. If you have any questions, um, feel free to type it in the chat. Um, and then while we're waiting for questions, Morgan, did you have anything to add? Awesome, no, thank you so much, Drew, for, um, for sharing all of this. And I just, I did wanna share with everyone listening in, we will um, get you this presentation out. So all the content and information that Drew just shared on, the, on your screen, uh, we'll, we'll share it with you a copy. Um, and we also have the, here we have our contact information for the entire business advising um, team. Um, I shared in the chat box um, the link to sign up for, to be paired with a free advisor if you, um, excuse me, if you haven't um, been meeting with an advisor and you're not part of our program already. We've got that information to share out with you as well. Um, but yes, I do want to just encourage any questions that you have, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and in the chat box. Um, I do see, oh, we do have one. Um, so Becky asks, how might someone who um, have to be in a, oh. <laughs> Becky would like to have you as an advisor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So if you're already with, working with us, um, Becky and anybody else listening in, um, what I'd encourage you to do is connect with your relationship manager. Um, that may be Danielle, Daniel, or Kim. If you're not sure who your relationship manager is, you can reach out to me after the fact as well and I'll get you connected. Um, and what we'll do is um, we can just connect on you know, what 
um, new needs you have um, for your um, for your business or for your where you're at at this point in time. If there's an, a new or an additional advisor that you would like to be working with, um, absolutely, we can get you in touch with somebody like Drew. <laughs> And then if you're a new person to our program, um, that sign up link is um, where you're going to go in order to get connected with someone like Drew. <laughs> and then, yeah, after the presentation, I believe it was Becky. So I'll, I'll try to look for that information, Morgan, and then get it to you and then you could pass it along. Uh, yes. Becky. Absolutely. Awesome. I'm not seeing any questions, but we'll stay here just for another minute or so. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of thank yous. So Drew, thank you so much. I want to um, pass out along the information that you've shared has been so helpful and useful to so many businesses in our community here, um, listening live. And also, you know, I'm excited to be able to have this in our repertoire to share out for anybody who's coming to us new with, with this challenge. Um, we do have um, another question that came in. How often should you do the profitability analysis? That's a good question. I don't think there's like one true like rule for it. It could, it could even be as, as little as a couple of times per year or even like a lot more often just based on your given circumstances. So I think it also depends on your industry. So I imagine in an industry like restaurants where they've been around for hundreds of years, there's probably not that much changing within like a given year. So maybe in a an industry like that where it doesn't change that much it's more reasonable to do it once a year twice a year whereas industries that maybe you're changing a little, a little bit quicker like those in the tech industry it might make sense to do it just a little bit more um but i think it's pretty easy once you've sort of like divided your customer segments and and different things like that so like it's pretty easy just to look at your profitability analysis month by month and like as each month's profit and loss statement comes out then you can compare this month's profit and loss versus your last month's profit and loss. And I think it's pretty easy just once your accounting software is set up to do it correctly, just to take a quick five to 10 minute look and see if there's any, any sort of trends uh, that you notice or to be concerned about. And then, yeah, as, as Morgan said, we'll, we'll stay on for a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, you're more than welcome to, to 